Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Carsten Schneider. I am welcoming you from Central European University based in Vienna now. Uh, I'm a professor of political science and since a couple of weeks also the prorector for external relations at CU. And uh, the purpose of this event today is that I introduced to you the um, tools, some of the tools that you can use once you have run your QCA uh, and to make more, to, more out of those uh, um, findings. And most of those tools will point you to uh, within case analysis. So post QCA tools are mostly about going back to cases and the uh, kind of tools that I'm going to present you, there will be a lot, is, if you will, um, a summary of a course that I'm offering uh, in the context of uh, the newly created MethodsNet summer school. Um, and while, of course, uh, the ambition cannot be that I teach you in 75 minutes um, what a, a week-long course with exercise and readings and so on would uh, take, um, the idea I had is that I give you a teaser what I will assume for the time being is that you are familiar with uh, the basics in QCA. Um, essentially, you can, you know, calibrate sets. You can turn, uh, you can produce a truth table and then logically minimize the truth table. And then you get a result. And that's where most articles stop. And, and that is something I want to uh, sort of overcome and say the real fun only starts after this, and the tools that I'm going to show you are about exactly uh, that. So in the language of a book that we have recently published, I'm holding it here uh, in the camera, we call it the um, um, pre-analytic moment, during the analytic moment, and after the analytic moment, where the analytic moment is the truth table analysis. So in my talk or our event today is the post-analytic moment. So once the results are there, what are we going to do with it? Um, so uh, let me kick off with um, the some slides, which I hope you're seeing here, um, where I'm going to, you know, take you from the following uh, uh, point of departure. You have run your QCA and you get what is a typical QCA result. A or B are sufficient for Y. I made it even a simple example because you see there is no conjunction. So there is no conjunctural causation. It's just two sufficient terms. A is sufficient for Y or B is sufficient for Y. You know, let's say your outcome Y is why uh, are some countries democratic? And it's either because they are rich, A, or because they are small, B. Then, you know, you would also report the parameters of fit, and you would see, well, you see consistency looks good uh, for both of sufficient terms. Um, you can explain uh, half, 56%, uh, if you will, of the cases with, uh, of the, uh, democratic cases because they're rich, 61% because they are small. Uh, overall, you explain uh, three quarters of your uh, cases. And this is this unique coverage where you see that there's a lot of overlap, meaning some cases are both rich and small. Um, and, you know, this is most what people do. Maybe they even uh, present a so-called XY plot, right? These are your cases and it really doesn't matter uh, the, the substantive example, but you would see a plot like this and say, here I present you my, my, my finding that A or B are sufficient for Y. But the question, and that is, that is the, the key perspective that I want to take on post QCA tools is which cases would I now choose for which analytic purpose to make more of, out of my results? So I want to go beyond just showing, oh, and see, yeah, Guatemala is here, Vietnam here. What is it, Jordan or Georgia? This uh, we can do better. So in a nutshell, advanced QCA, the way I present it to you now, <clears throat> is going back to cases. And the five tools, or let's say four of the five tools that I'm presenting to you are tools for identifying cases that give you most uh, bang for the buck. So that once you do a within case analysis of those cases, you learn more about the question you are trying to answer, to which QCA has given you some uh, uh, leverage, but you want to do more. 
So what are these five tools? <clears throat> the first one that I will talk about is called set theoretic multi-method research. That is, that is by definition, this going back to cases and do within case analysis. And I will spend some time on this and I'm about to finish a book uh, on this. Uh, and uh, sort of this has accompanied me more than a decade now and I want to finally put it all together. So you, uh, we spend probably a little bit more time on that. But then uh, there is also recent tools in QCA to test the robustness of your QCA results, which not only test how robust your result is, but also identify cases, robust or not robust cases, and that can be useful. The third tool I will talk about is called theory evaluation. Uh, also there, it's not only about you evaluating a theory or that you had prior to your QCA, so you evaluate the theory based on your QCA finding, but it also identifies types of cases that are that you can use uh, for within case analysis and follow up case studies. And a uh, fourth uh, tool, so-called cluster diagnostics, I will say something about it. And last but not least, as an advanced tool for QCA, uh, the integration of time and temporality into your QCA analysis. The last one here is not strictly speaking about cases, uh, going back to cases, but uh, I will certainly, well, will say something about it and certainly belongs to advanced uh, QCA tools. Okay, so then let's start with SMMR. Um, so the definition, and sorry for a little bit uh, too much text, but it is set theoretic multi-method research. You, you should understand that's what it says there the combination of a cross-case analysis, so the QCA, the truth table analysis at the cross-case level, 20 cases, 200 cases, 2,000, 20,000, it doesn't matter. Um, combine that with a within-case analysis of specific cases on the mechanism linking your sufficient condition with the outcome. And you do this for either descriptive or causal inference purposes. So. In essence, it means we want to identify the within case mechanism M that connects the cross case condition X with the outcome Y. So this follow up case study is not QCA, but you use the QCA to identify the cases that you need to investigate. And so let me, uh, well, uh, the graph that maybe illustrates it a little bit more. So we have, you are rich. We found that being rich is sufficient for being a democracy. That is what the QCA told us. What we don't know, but what is the theoretical claim most of the time is that, well, because you're rich, it triggers a mechanism through which the outcome, being a democracy is triggered. Say rich means you have a sort of a, a larger middle class that is politically more moderate and therefore a democracy is feasible. That would be a mechanism. And now the question is, is that true? Is this empirically true? So an SMMR tells you which cases do you need to select to test that claim? And for answering that question, let me switch to um, a, um, a set of um, uh, slides that I have prepared or a whiteboard, so to speak. And this is a Venn diagram. And since we will see it four times, uh, let me give, uh, give you a small introduction of what you see here. So in this box, you see all cases that are part of your study, say 20,000 or 10,000 or 20 cases. Inside the circle for Y, this one, you see all cases that are members of the outcome. Okay. And then you see in the circle for A, we have the members, uh, the cases that are members of condition A. So they're rich countries and uh, circle for B is small countries. So if I now want to test or uh, whether or not for rich countries, the mechanism of having a moderate middle class operates, which cases do you need to select? And the answer given in SMMR is, well, you have to select typical cases. So typical for what? Typical for both being a member of A and of Y. So they are representing this A leading to Y relation. That means all cases in that intersection between A and Y. So this area here, if you want. Okay, but now watch out. 
the, this area where A and Y overlap has an area where it also overlaps with B. So these are the cases that are both rich, A, and small. So this, the cases in this area are democratic for two reasons. And the, the, the sort of guideline in SMMR is you should not choose those, but you should use, choose uniquely typical cases. So a case that is only typical for A and not also for B. And there you have the best uh, setup for a within case analysis on mechanism M. And only if you find that in this typical case, not only is A present and Y present, that is what we know from the QCA, but also M is your causal claim that A is sufficient for Y because it operates through mechanism M confirmed. Right? Uh, not so good choices would be typical, uh, jointly typical cases, because there you don't know whether or not the mechanism M is present because of A or of B. It could be of both or not. So you make it unnecessarily complicated. But there is more uh, that uh, SMMR uh, tells us, and there's more you can do out of your QCA study in terms of going back to cases. For instance, see here, there is cases that have A, but not why? They are so-called contradictory cases, or so they lower the consistency. So the claim that A is sufficient for Y is not completely consistent because some cases don't have the outcome. These are so-called deviant consistency cases. And SMMR says, if you are interested in finding out uh, uh, what's wrong, I mean, what's wrong with the claim that A is sufficient for Y, B, why is it not fully consistent or why is there so much inconsistency? You would study a deviant consistency case and wonder what is lacking from case. So it has A, but it must lack something else that is needed, say condition X. Uh, so it's a missing conjunct. Something is missing from the uh, uh, sufficient term A and let's call it X. And once you add that to it, the circle here for A, which then represents A and X is a smaller circle. And if you're lucky, uh, all this area here disappears. So the deviant consistency case becomes not a deviant consistency case, uh, but an irrelevant case. I say something about them in a second. Uh, and the last type of case that you would want to go back after your QCA is cases that you don't explain. They are called deviant coverage cases. So you have here um, the outcome why, so being a democracy occurs in those cases, but none of the reasons that you could identify in your QCA explains those cases. So they are neither rich nor are they small, but yet they are democracies. So these are deviant coverage cases. And you want, you, if you do as uh, within case analysis of those cases, the goal is to find a missing disjunct. So it A or B is too little. Maybe you figure out in these cases, actually it was factor Q, Q, which you had overlooked. It wasn't in your truth table. It was totally not in the, among the theories that you have been looking at, but you find out, well, those cases are explained by an omitted disjunct Q. Whereas, let me also add that here, we had said before uh, that it's uh, A or X, which solves uh, the, you know, the, the, the inconsistencies for rich countries, A. Well, that is, and well, maybe just for completeness, there is also a set of cases out here. They have neither are the members of the outcome nor are they members of any known sufficient term. And they enough in and of themselves are what we call individually irrelevant. So they don't contradict your claim of the sufficiency, nor do you need to explain them because they don't have the outcome. However, as and that would be going too far now, they play a crucial role uh, uh, when you do within case analysis in, of a comparative type. So when you compare a typical case, you should compare it to the adequate individually relevant case to show that taking A away makes not only the outcome go away, that we know from the QCA, but also the mechanism go away. Okay. So let me uh, uh, start by saying uh, and following up on what uh, Adrian rightly brought up that uh, if you use QCA in its traditional original version, 10, 20, 25 cases, 
maybe that tool of robustness test is, is less of a concern than when you exceed this and you use QCA more in a, I don't want to say quantitative, but larger in fashion. And so that's point one. Point two, it was from the beginning of QCA, one of the criticisms was that, well, it seems that you made up the result. And if you only chose a slightly different parameters in your analysis, so slightly higher or lower consistency threshold, slightly higher or lower frequency cutoff in the truth table, and if you calibrated your sets maybe slightly differently, your results would be totally different. And you know the, the bad side of this argument was that people pretended that this is a specific feature of QCA and it must be like this. So that people A, always cheat and it's, it, it cannot sort of uh, reveal anything meaningful because of this. So that was bothering me. And two, it was, they would describe practices that I personally know from other methods too. I mean, how many regressions are run before you get what you think uh, is uh, meaningful and so on. The difference between doing it in regression and doing it in QCA is in QCA, you, you are actually asked to go back and forth between your ideas and the evidence that you generate, go back, recalibrate, and so on. This is what, this is to me the qualitative part of QCA and is not something uh, forbidden. Whereas in inferential statistics, you should go to, you know, to the inferential statistics jail if you do that. So, but having said that, there is a point in responding to the question, how is your specific result, you, not the QCA as a method in general, but your QCA result that you've produ you produced and you want to publish, how sensitive is it to slightly different analytic choices and, and equally plausible choices? And that is what the robustness test is doing. That is a paper that uh, we have published some two years ago with Nina Oana and me. So how much does your QCA solution depend on analytic decisions, calibration, consistency, and NCAT that could have been taken slightly differently? And if a lot, if it's a lot sensitive, uh, then your results show low robustness. Good. So far, so good. But what, it, what I want to talk about uh, uh, here in the context of today's presentation is you can use robustness tests also for case selection for within case analysis. And let me show how that would uh, work. So I have uh, another of those Venn diagrams. And again, inside the box are all your cases. Then the circle of Y again has all cases where the outcome is present. And um, the circle for S is your empirical solution, your QCA solution, which was A or B. So all cases that are A or B are here. And then what is this T? T is... <clears throat> the summary of all the QCA solutions that you generate by slightly calibrating A differently or slightly calibrating B differently by using a different consistency threshold in your truth table or a different uh, frequency cutoff. So you can do many changes. You produce many, many QCA, alternative QCA results, which we call test sets, and then you combine them we explain in the paper how, but it essentially gives you another set. So there will be cases uh, in that circle for T. And now what you get is the more S overlaps with T. So if S and T were identical, then your results are absolutely uh, immune against the changes you have done to consistency, end cut and calibration. So whatever you change, you always get the same result. But what is more likely empirically and, and conceptually is that there is not a full overlap between your solution and the, th uh, the test set. So that there are different areas and these different areas give you uh, now types of cases that are uh, information that is important for within case analysis. So anything that is within, uh, well, so let's say, let's start differently. Look at this overlap here, this is where your, your empirical solution and the, the robustness test sets overlap. And this is, sorry, I took the, that is if you, the cases here are the robust typical cases. So, and you could then say, well, I should probably for my within case analysis in SMMR and that I have been talking about before, you should probably not choose just a typical case for A, but you should choose a robust typical case for A. 
as opposed to a shaky typical case. You know, this is case is typical for A, but if you ch change your analytic setup slightly, it's not robust. It, it, it does, it's not typical anymore. It, it is not within the set of T. And, you know, there is also uh, the, the possibility uh, that you have possible typical cases. So if only you had a slightly different setup, then this case, which is, if you only look at the circle S, that possible typical case would be a deviant coverage case. So it's not explained, but has the outcome. But it could be explained if only you changed your analytic setup slightly. So possible, robust, and shaky typical cases. Um, you have also, let's say, take, take this. Um, this one is probably interesting here. It's an extreme deviant coverage case. So a case that has the outcome but it's not in your solution, so you cannot explain it, nor can any of your alternative solutions in your robustness test cover this case. So this, this is really out, out, far out there. So maybe you just should not choose a deviant coverage, but maybe an extreme deviant coverage case because they are really out, out there, different theories, that not, not related to anything that you put in your truth table. Uh, you know, we have again our irrelevant cases down here. They have neither are the members of the outcome, nor of your solution, nor of the test set. So you can forget about those. Um, maybe interesting uh, uh, is, you know, we have the possible deviant consistency cases, the shaky deviant consistency cases, and the, sorry, the, the ones uh, here. I mean, I want to, yes, connect to this area there. These are the robust deviant consistency cases. There, I don't have any suggestions which of, one, which of them you should choose for follow-up case studies, I think. Theory evaluation. <clears throat> and um, most, or maybe all of you in the room must have read uh, Reagan's book in, uh, from 87. There is chapter 11.3, I think. No, well, somewhere in, it's really one and a half pages only where he exposes this idea. And like so many things that I thought, oh, great idea. And then I go back to his book. It's oftentimes already written there uh, and maybe not elaborate, but the idea is certainly there. And one of them is theory evaluation. So what is this? Uh, it's not hypothesis testing, but it's trying to see what is the overlap between your initial theoretical hunches so you think that A and B is sufficient or C or D, this is what you distilled from the literature. Then you run your QCA and you see how much, what is the overlap between what you thought in the beginning and what you empirically could show. And so what you get, sorry, is not a yes, no, my theory got confirmed or no, but it's an evaluation. The overlap between your theory and uh, initial uh, and QCA finding is partial. And surprise, surprise, will give rise to types of cases that I want to uh, show you. And for this, I go to, again, a uh, Venn diagram. Uh, so not, it, it's what an Euler diagram. So it's a diagram. Again, the box means all cases. And now I structured it like this. Above this horizontal line, you have all cases that are members of Y. Below is the not Y. So they don't have Y. Here, S, again, is my theoretical, my, my empirical finding, which was A or B is sufficient for Y. And T now is what I have distilled from the literature. So maybe the literature, you say one, some section in the library, people say, well, you must combine A and B. Others say, well, no, it's C and D combined, which is sufficient. So this is what you think the authors that you rely on are saying, this is what you find. Now, the question is, have I confirmed or disconfirmed these claims? Well, and the answer is partially. And you can graphically show this. So, and so uh, you have an overlap between the theoretical expectation and the empirical findings. So anything in that uh, uh, intersection is what confirms theory. That part of the theory is confirmed. That part of the theory is not confirmed. And these cases are surprisingly members of the outcome 
but you didn't expect it based on theory. Okay, so we, we give names to them. And this is from, uh, I can show this maybe too, uh, this 2012 book with uh, Claudius Wagemann, where we spell these things out and they are now also implemented in the uh, set methods package in R. It gives you all the information that I'm conceptually showing you now. So, and the names of the cases, let's say everything that is in T in what the theory expects are called most likely cases. And the ones outside of T are least likely cases. So, and you would have here the covered most likely case. It, it is explained by QCA, your finding, and you expected it to uh, have the outcome. So it's the covered uh, most likely case. And then there's also a consistent most likely case uh, down here. Sorry, but I uh, sometimes I'm mixing these things up. Well, it probably isn't uh, that uh, uh, interesting. Maybe I will not move all the case labels in here. But let me say that you can also now uh, look at extreme sort of interesting cases. What about this one here? This is a case that according to your theory should not have the outcome. According to your, uh, uh, to your uh, solution, QCA solution shouldn't have the outcome, yet it has the outcome. It's an uncovered, so you don't explain it, not expected, least likely case. And that seems to me the one that you should probably look at uh, uh, when you do a follow-up case study. So it shouldn't be just a deviant coverage case, but an uncovered, least likely case. Um, and so, so maybe I leave it at this uh, uh, level. There are other cases down here too. I have labeled them, but I would say for within case analysis on the mechanism, a typical case should be a covered most likely case. And a deviant coverage case should be probably least likely to get most uh, uh, out of the analysis of those uh, within case analysis of those cases. Mm. I just wonder, well, you know, just uncovered most likely case. So it should have, you expect it to have the outcome, but you can't explain it, yet it has the outcome um, and so on. Um, cluster diagnostics, and it's compared to all the others, much simpler. Uh, so what is the idea behind it? So you run your QCA and you get your result. And it could be that you have missed something in your in your in your um, uh, truth table. So there might be analytically relevant differences among your cases that you cannot haven't captured with any of your conditions. Say one example: you have time series data. So, or, or, yeah, panel data. So you have your country is measured in 2000, 2005, and 2010. And you have 20 cases, and each of them is measured at three different time points. But you throw them all in one box, run your QCA, and uh, you get a result. And now the cluster diagnostics gives you an answer to the question, well, is your pooled data result, does it hold for just the cases in 2000? And for just the cases in 2005? And just the cases in 2010? If yes, so if you get the same result in all three time periods, then your pooling is fine. If not, then pooling is not fine because it's just an average about, uh, across countries or time periods that follows apparently different logics. Example one. Example two, you could say, I have a global study, all countries from all over the world, from all continents. If you throw them all in one box, you run your QCA, and then the follow-up cluster diagnostics could be does my result hold only for African countries? Does it hold for all European, for only Asian and Latin American or Northern American? So you can, that's cluster diagnostics. Uh, so are there analytically relevant clusters of cases, geographic, temporal, substantive, in your data that are not accounted for by your QCA? If yes, you can do three things. Either you abandon pooling and you run separate analysis for Latin America, for Asia, for Africa. Or you add the missing condition. Say the condition is a multi-value set world region. You can add that to the truth table. 
or you restrict your scope condition. You could find maybe my results hold for all world regions except for Latin America. So maybe you have to restrict your scope condition and exclude Latin American cases because they follow a different causal logic. So, so what I'm saying is it looks like this uh, in, in uh, um, if you will. So here we say the example was rich countries are sufficient and small countries is sufficient for uh, being a democracy. And so there are some deviant cases and this symbol means big countries and this symbol, sorry, it should be green. Well, anyway, I haven't checked. These ones uh, are not a big countries, so I say small countries. And you see that among the rich countries, oh, sorry, no, big, small, that's, sorry, that's a stupid, uh, no, B is already big and small. It should be uh, English speaking, English speaking, and this is French speaking, say. Sorry. So now you see that among the rich countries, all those that speak French are deviating from your claim that being rich is sufficient for democracy. So that's not true for French countries. And the cluster diagnostic would tell you that uh, it would look something like what I have been drawing here. And then you can draw a conclusion. Well, just add speaking English as a condition to your uh, analysis and see what you kind of finding you get. So uh, add the omitted condition, English speaking, yes, no, or English, French, and, and German, or what is it as a multi-value? Or you say, well, I exclude French speaking world for theoretical reasons, not just because they deviate, you have to have some reason for why you exclude them. So restrict the scope conditions uh, or run a separate and or run a separate analysis for just French speaking countries separate from English speaking. So split your cases into two groups. Time and temporality. So this uh, rather awkward thing that QCA as a qualitative method is but you know, not particularly strong in handling aspects, causally relevant aspects of time and temporality. So the sequence of events that matters or the duration of events or whether it came suddenly or cre creeped in, all these uh, features that uh, are, you know, the strong feature of, of qualitative research, trying to model this with QCA at the cross case level is very difficult. Uh, so there are, it's not strictly about going back to cases, what I'm saying here, but there are different ways of making QCA findings more informative or more sensitive to aspects of time and temporality, such as two-step QCA, where you separate, say, your less list of conditions, uh, say 10, you, 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 you see that conceptually some of them, say five, are temporarily remote. I mean, so they are, they originated far back in time. So structural features. So it's about democracy, yes or no. Far back in time, it could be, has the country be a democracy in the last hundred years? Is it uh, socioeconomically developed? And so these kind of things. And then the close of proximate factors are, is it a presidential system uh, or a proportional representation uh, uh, electoral system, so much closer to the outcome that you want to explain. And you could run the two-step UCA and, and that has some sort of temporal notion to it. There is even a, a, a QCA form that is called temporal QCA, which to a very limited extent can reveal whether or not it is the sequence within in which conditions emerged method for the outcome. So Say you see A and B, A and B is sufficient for Y. And it's important that first occurs A and then occurs B. Only then they jointly produce the outcome. If first B occurs and then A, it doesn't work. Say if you are first a small country and then become rich, you become a democracy. But if you are first rich and then become a small country, uh, for whatever reason, you lost the war, then you don't become a democracy. So the sequence matters. And then a third set of uh, tools called coincidence analysis or a causal chain analysis where you can mostly using brute force uh, figure out whether in this, whether again, there is a sequence. So not only is the sequence in which conditions emerge relevant, but that there is a causal dependence between conditions. So A causes B causes C is, and that causes the outcome. 
that would be a causal chain uh, analysis. And there are tools out there and uh, Adrian uh, you know, has written on this causal chain. So it's implemented in the QCA package. Uh, uh, coincidence analysis is something similar to QCA by Michael Baumgartner doing, doing what I just said, that trying to identify causal chains. But the thing I wanted to say about it is nothing beats the within case analysis of mechanisms when, if and when you want to make your analysis more time sensitive. All of them are either, you know, play with trivial notions of time and temporality or, and or are very, very unstable, uh, subject to, you know, not robust simply. I mean, the robustness, especially for this causal chain coincidence analysis is, I think, a very big issue. And, uh, often can also lead to results that are implausible. So the, 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 so you get model ambiguity and you get sometimes implausible or impossible results uh, out of it. So it's nice to have it, but I think it's still in its infancies and it doesn't resolve the quest for making QCA more time sensitive. And I think there it's much better to go back to cases and, and do that. 